HIV AIDS crosses cultural, racial, ethnic, religious, and socioeconomic borders affecting every one of us. Since 1981, more than one million people in the United States have been affected. African American women account for the largest share of new infections among women. Every year, 300,000 children are infected with HIV and nearly two million people die. It is a disease that knows no boundary. We are at the International AIDS Conference. I hold it every two years around the world. It's a place for scientists and activists and people who are HIV positive to come learn what's going on. It's a place that we think Jesus would be right smack dab in the middle of the biggest convention of people who are HIV positive. At this year's International AIDS Conference, we decided to invite other pastors to attend with us. It's our desire to raise up local church leaders to become advocates for those infected and affected with HIV and AIDS. I grew up Muslim and do know what it means to feel like an untouchable part of a community that has some stigma around it. That's part of the reason I'm here at the conference. I'm hoping that this will help me engage. My connection to the issue of HIV AIDS is pretty much non-existent. I've never done a message on it. We don't have a organized ministry for people with HIV AIDS. Other than what I've seen on the nightly news, I know zero. When a crisis hits you personally, it takes on a whole different dimension. Four people in my family have been infected by HIV AIDS and two have passed away. So it's, it's very, very personal. So kind of what I want to do is I want to come here and get educated and get passionate. I want to come here uh, to make an impact. So we sat in this first session this morning. It's overwhelming. There is so much medical research. The science led to interventions. And if you look at the evolution of treatment strategies, the first drug in 1987, AZT. I don't have a clue. The majority of what they're saying, it's amazing to me the effort to do whatever we can to try to reduce the number of individuals that, that are living with AIDS. The science is great, we need that. Um, the medicine is great, we need that. There's no discussion of, let's really get to the core issue. There seems to be, let's deal with the symptoms, but why is what's happening, happening? Uh, coming from a family where HIV, uh, or, I'm sorry, where intravenous drug use drove them to find some type of satisfaction in the drugs. There's a spiritual issue that's leading somebody somewhere to do the things that, that they're doing. Okay. So let's start with UK. Through what process did you realize you were called to do this kind of work at this time in your lives? That time they were saying 40 million people infected with HIV. And said, how could there be 40 million people in the world infected with an incurable virus and I not know a single one of them? I realized I had, I had come to the proverbial fork in the road and I could either stay with my comfortable life just exactly the way it was and pretend like I had never read that article or I could decide that there was something here that God was calling me to become an advocate. When Kay was talking about her personal connection to this, unless you take something extremely personal, there's only surface level solutions. Are we going to basically and corporately, you know, deal with this issue or are we going to really get deep and personal with it? Hello. How are you? So what, what is uh, HIPS? HIPS stands for like helping individual prostitutes survive. We work with sex workers, male, female, and transgender, as well as people who use needles and all those different kinds wow. of things. Do you guys ever work with, with churches? The church does use our office on Sundays. Really? But yeah. But we really try to like engage with people on that emotional level. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Walking through the global village, my heart broke for the people. The majority of the people who consider themselves outsiders uh, of the church are scared of us. They're concerned about us. Some are fearful, some are just very cautious of us. As a church, we've lost any right to speak into this issue, which is really sad. 
Meraki. Meraki? Yeah. Just had a conversation with this uh, girl named Meraki. Uh, he's from Nashville, I'm from North Carolina. Really? Yeah. Okay. She works for Condomize, and I think what she was trying to get from me is, how much do you care? You know, do you care enough to kind of dialogue with us and maybe even accept us in one sense. I think the church has got to understand you don't have a relationship and then you accept people. You accept them and then you have a relationship. This year Saddleback hosted a booth at the AIDS conference in order to give our members and pastors an opportunity to share with attenders the love of Jesus Christ and show them that we care about them. Today I was at the booth and people were coming up asking questions. As I began to talk to them about the church waking up and getting involved in the fight against HIV AIDS, the surprise and shock of people saying, what the church is getting involved? And so I felt like that that was a, a huge breakthrough of meeting people where they are and uh, this is going to help me tremendously. Today was awesome. I had all kinds of uh, first time experiences. Uh, we got caught up in a, in a protest and I've never been a part of a protest in my life. And all of a sudden we get caught in the middle of two or three hundred people that are just kind of going down a hallway and protesting. And protesting has never made any sense to me. I, I've always viewed it, honestly, as just kind of a waste of time. I've always had a voice. You know, wh where I was born and what I've done, I've just, I've always had a voice. I've never been in a situation in my life where I felt like I didn't have a voice, where I had to pick up a sign and chant something to get somebody's attention. It was just breaking my arrogant spirit, really, is, is what it was to, uh, how arrogant it was of me to think that, that protesting is a waste of time. It's so important for me to just put myself in their position and to realize that's who Jesus came for, people who, who didn't have a voice. We're getting ready to go into a training session with pastors from the D.C. area to figure out what we can do together to create an AIDS-free generation. Our nation's capital has the distinction of being the city with the highest percentage of people who are HIV positive in the United States. We are really interested in this issue because as the data shows, uh, our church is right really at the epicenter. Uh, we're in Ward 7 where the rate is the second highest in the city and we're just blocks away from Ward 8 where they have the distinction of being number one. What role can the church play? If you're for fighting the atrocities of this disease, we can work together. Mm -hmm. This work is a necessary work. If we stick together and do it well, we will break down barriers, we will overcome stigma, and we will show what the love of God is like. We will demonstrate it to each and every one. There were pastors who were full on, ready to do whatever it took, talking about how they can collaborate, how they can serve the community of people that have HIV. For me, it was a lot of hope to see that the church is not just on the margins, but that the church can have an active role. We can mobilize people, and when you mobilize people for a common vision, a common cause, incredible things can take place. This pandemic, I believe, gives the church the greatest opportunity for compassion that we have in our generation. And if we're leading out front on this, D.C. pastors and D.C. churches could actually be the model for the rest of the nation. My prayer is that out of this meeting, these churches will begin to be a model for other cities across America. The real conviction for me is I have a platform, but I need to use that platform to be a voice for people who don't have a voice. And if I'm honest, I, I have not done that, certainly in this issue of HIV AIDS. I don't know if I have a single relationship with a person who has AIDS. And I think that's a great place for me to start, is to build a relationship with someone who has AIDS. I'm not the same person that when I got here. 
I've learned so much more about HIV AIDS. I've learned about attitudes. I've learned about stereotypes. I've learned how the church can uniquely do exceedingly above and beyond what any organization on planet Earth can do. So now is the key to go back to Charlotte with the leadership team of Transformation Church and pray and pray and pray and then wait for a plan and then begin to unfold that to the congregation to be able to mobilize themselves. We have to leverage love. We have to care for the people in our city who have HIV. This is going to take, personally, being very proactive, a holistic ministry that impacts spirit, soul, and body, serving the people in our city who have HIV. The story doesn't end with a conference, an event. I don't really know how the story ends, but I pray that these young, influential pastors will raise their voices on behalf of those living with HIV and AIDS in their churches, in their communities, and around the world. For Jesus' sake.